Here's a weird fact. America has the technology to build floating cities. We have the money. We have the need with rising sea levels. We even have designs ready to go. But we have zero floating cities. Not one. Meanwhile, countries with far fewer resources are already testing prototypes. What's going on? After months of research, I've uncovered the truth about why floating cities don't exist in America. And it reveals something surprising about our nation's approach to innovation. Imagine your home underwater by 2050. This isn't the plot of some dystopian Netflix series. It's the reality that millions of Americans living in coastal cities might face sooner than we think. Miami residents already joke about sunny day flooding, where high tides regularly turn streets into canals, even without a drop of rain. But it won't be funny when the water doesn't recede. The footage from recent years tells the story better than I could. Remember Hurricane Sandy turning the New York subway into an underground river? Or Hurricane Ida dropping so much rain on New Orleans that rescue boats navigated through neighborhoods? These aren't freak accidents anymore. They're previews of our new normal. The numbers are honestly kind of terrifying. By 2050, America is projected to lose over 300,000 homes to chronic flooding. That's not including commercial buildings, infrastructure, or the 13 million Americans who could be displaced by rising seas before the end of the century. For perspective, that is roughly the entire population of Pennsylvania having to pack up and move inland. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, the Dutch are basically laughing at our incompetence. They've been managing water for centuries with impressive innovation. Rotterdam has floating pavilions that rise and fall with water levels. They've built room for the river projects that intentionally allow controlled flooding in designated areas. And they're not alone. The Maldives opened the floating city project last year with homes designed to rise with the tides. The thing is, seawalls and levees are already proving inadequate. New Orleans spent billions on its system after Katrina, but it failed again during Hurricane Ida. Miami Beach's $500 million investment in raising roads and installing pumps is just buying time. It's like using a band-aid when you need surgery. Floating cities represent the logical next evolutionary step. Imagine a Miami where instead of a abandoning the coastline, neighborhoods transition to platforms that rise with the water. Picture New York Harbor with floating extensions that create new housing, while prot a cutting Manhattan from storm surges. The technology exists. Floating concrete platforms using the same principles that keep aircraft carriers afloat, connected by flexible bridges and anchored to the seabed. These aren't just fantasy concepts. Oceanics, a company working with UN Habitat, has designed floating neighborhoods for 10,000 residents with shared public spaces, sustainable aquaponic food systems, and zero waste. Blue 21 has developed floating structures that can withstand hurricane force winds. The Danish firm BIG has plans for floating cities that could be implemented today. Yet somehow, America, supposedly the global innovation leader, doesn't have a single operational floating neighborhood. Not one. The same country that put people on the moon, built the Hoover Dam, and invented smartphones apparently can't figure out how to build homes that float. It's like we're still trying to solve 21st century problems with 20th century solutions. Look, I'm not saying building floating cities is easy. If it were, we'd have them already. But when countries with a fraction of our GDP are actively testing prototypes while we debate whether climate change is even real, something's clearly off. The Maldives has a GDP smaller than Vermont, yet they're already building their floating future. The Dutch have been experimenting with floating structures since the early 2000s, and we're still stuck on building higher seawalls that we know will eventually fail. While the Dutch float and the Maldives adapt, America's own floating city dreams have already run aground once before. Remember that time Silicon Valley almost built an independent floating nation in the South Pacific. The spectacular implosion of this venture reveals why the U.S. keeps missing the boat on oceanic innovation. It all started with the Seasteading Institute, founded in 2008 by political economist Patrick Friedman, grandson of Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman, and tech billionaire Peter Thiel. Their vision wasn't just about floating architecture, it was a libertarian dream of creating autonomous societies beyond government control. Imagine Silicon Valley's move fast and break things mentality, but for entire countries. By 2017, they'd move beyond theoretical discussions. The Seasteading Institute actually signed a memorandum of understanding with French Polynesia to develop a special economic zone for a floating city in a protected lagoon. This wasn't just a pipe dream. 
they had secured millions in funding, primarily from Silicon Valley investors who were captivated by the idea of starting fresh societies with minimal regulation. The concept of seasteading involves creating permanent dwellings at sea, outside territorial waters, essentially floating cities that operate under their own rules. And the French Polynesia project was supposed to be the first real implementation. Their promotional materials showed sleek, hexagonal platforms connected by walkways with sustainable buildings, vertical farms, and enough space for thousands of residents. The designs looked like something straight out of a science fiction movie, except they were backed by serious engineering studies. We were going to create a proof of concept for seasteading by building floating islands with real houses, real research facilities, real hotels and restaurants said Joe Quirk, president of the Seasteading Institute. Our team of marine biologists, nautical engineers, aquaculture farmers, maritime attorneys, medical researchers, security personnel, and investors will be able to demonstrate to the world that seasteading is not just possible, but necessary. But here's where things get interesting. And by interesting, I mean it all went horribly wrong. Despite having government approval on paper, the project hit massive political resistance. Local Polynesians began uh, protesting what they saw as a wealthy foreigners attempting to create a tax-free you know, haven in their waters. The backlash grew when a promotional document leaked referring to the project as a way to liberate humanity from politicians. I mean, who would have thought that walking into someone else's country and saying, we're here to liberate you from your government? might cause problems. It's almost like colonialism leaves a bad taste in people's mouths or something. French Polynesian officials started backpedaling fast. The president who signed the initial agreement faced criticism, and by 2018, government officials announced that the memorandum had expired. The project wasn't just delayed, it was dead in the water. Funding dried up as investors realized that the political realities of building floating cities were far more complex than the technological challenges. The fallout was enormous. The high-profile failure scared away potential investors from similar projects in U.S. waters. After all, if a project could and succeed in the welcoming waters of the South Pacific with government approval, what chance would it have in the heavily regulated coastal waters of the United States? What's fascinating is that the project didn't fail primarily because of engineering problems. The designs were ambitious but feasible. It wasn't even the money. There was plenty of Silicon Valley cash ready to fund the experiment. The real shipwreck happened when Seasteading's libertarian ideology crashed into the reality of national sovereignty, local politics, and colonial history. While libertarian dreamers were busy fighting political battles, they conveniently sidestepped two monsters lurking beneath the surface. The raw physics of hurricane force waves and the labyrinthine maze of maritime regulations that would make even the most determined entrepreneur seasick. Ever wondered what happens when a 185 mile per hour hurricane slams into your floating paradise? It's not pretty. When Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas in 2019, it generated waves over 60 feet high. Now imagine your floating neighborhood facing that kind of force. The physics are brutal. Water is about 800 times denser than air which means waves pack an exponentially greater punch than wind alone. A 20 foot wave doesn't just splash against your floating home. It delivers the equivalent force of being hit by a concrete wall. The engineering challenges are mind-boggling. You can't just build a regular building and expect it to float and survive storms. Floating structures need specialized, flexible connections that can move with the waves without snapping. They need dampening systems that absorb wave energy rather than fighting it. And they need s deep water anchoring that can hold position during storms while still allowing some movement. It's like trying to build a skyscraper on a trampoline. Possible in theory, but insanely complex in practice. And here's the kicker. Even if you solved all the engineering problems, you'd still have to navigate the most convoluted legal system imaginable. The United States has 17 different federal agencies with jurisdiction over various aspects of marine activities and structures. 17. That's not a government. That's a committee designed to never make a decision. Let's start with the Coast Guard, which regulates vessel safety. Our floating cities vessels, well, they float, so maybe. Then there's the Army Corps of Engineers, which controls all construction in U.S. waters. The Environmental Protection Agency monitors 
water quality, and waste disposal. The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management controls the seabed. No AA oversees marine sanctuaries. The list goes on and on. And we haven't even touched on the Jones Act yet. America's sacred maritime law that requires vessels operating between U.S. ports to be American-built, American-owned, and American-crewed. It's basically a law designed to make anything floating exponentially more expensive. Want to bring supplies to your floating city? Better make sure that cargo ship meets all Jones Act requirements, or you might be paying fines larger than your construction budget. Then there's the question of territorial waters. The U.S. claims jurisdiction up to 12 nautical miles offshore for most purposes, and an exclusive economic zone extending 200 nautical miles. Where exactly would you put your floating city? Too close to shore, and you're subject to all state and local regulations. Too far out, and you're in international waters where you have no protection from, I don't know, pirates? or other countries deciding your floating experiment looks like a nice addition to the territory. This is where the concept of flags of convenience comes in. Some floating city advocates suggest operating under the flag of nations like Panama or Liberia, which have more relaxed maritime regulations. But then you're essentially saying your floating city isn't American at all. Good luck getting U.S. government services or protection when you've deliberately chosen to be a foreign entity sitting off the American coast. And here's a fun legal question nobody has answered. If your floating city is registered as a vessel under a foreign flag, but it never actually moves, is it a vessel or an artificial island? If it's deemed an artificial island, then the U.S. can claim jurisdiction over it anyway under international law. It's like trying to follow a legal treasure map, where X marks a spot that keeps moving. Legal mazes might be confusing, but they're nothing compared to the financial black hole that swallows floating city proposals. When engineers start calculating actual costs, suddenly those libertarian dreamers get very quiet about who's footing the billion dollar bills. And that's not an exaggeration. We're talking about potentially the most expensive real estate development in human in history. Let's break down these astronomical numbers. A modest floating platform capable of supporting just a few hundred residents starts at around $100 million. That's just for the basic structure, a concrete slab that floats. Want a full-fledged floating city for 10,000 people? You're looking at tens of billions of dollars minimum. For comparison, the entire Hudson Yards development in New York, the largest private real estate project in U.S. history cost about $25 billion. That was built on actual land where construction is way cheaper. The utilities alone would make your monthly bills look like monopoly money. On land, you can hook up to existing power grids, water systems, and sewage treatment. On water, you're basically building all that infrastructure from scratch. Power generation likely means expensive solar arrays, wind turbines, or even small floating nuclear reactors that would make environmentalists have a collective heart attack. Fresh water requires a desalination plants that gulp energy. And waste management? Let's just say you can't just flush and forget when you're surrounded by ocean. Then there's the fun part of maintaining these structures. Marine environments are basically kryptonite for building materials. Salt water corrodes metal five to ten times faster than fresh water. Concrete deteriorates. Barnacles and algae accumulate. Studies suggest maintenance costs for marine structures run three to four times higher than their land-based counterparts. Your floating home would literally be dissolving beneath your feet, unless you constantly repaired it. And good luck getting insurance. Insurance companies hate the unknown, and nothing says unknown risk, quite like unprecedented floating city in hurricane-prone waters. Lloyds of London, which specializes in insuring the uninsurable, would likely charge premiums so high you'd need to be a tech billionaire just to afford the monthly payments. What happens when the first storm hits? Yeah, does everyone evacuate? Who pays if the whole thing breaks apart and sinks? Beyond the money problem, there's a cultural barrier most seasteading enthusiasts conveniently ignore. Americans love their space. We invented the suburb specifically to get away from each other. The average American home is around 2,300 square feet, far larger than homes in most countries where floating developments are being considered. But efficient floating cities require dense, compact, living arrangements where resources can be shared. Think 400 square foot apartments with shared kitchens and common spaces. Now try selling that to someone who expects a three car garage and a backyard. The current designs for floating cities look more like college dormitories than the American dream. Shared walls, shared utilities, shared everything. That works great in cultures accustomed to communal living, but Americans have 
historically revolted against such arrangements. We're the country where people sued to prevent apartment buildings from ruining the character of single family neighborhoods. Now imagine telling those same people they need to live in what amounts to a floating apartment complex where they can hear their neighbors' arguments through the walls. Even if some Americans were willing to try this lifestyle, they'd be paying premium prices for tiny spaces. Initial cost estimates suggest floating city real estate would run about three to four times higher per square foot than comparable land property. A 500 square foot floating apartment might cost over a million dollars, more than a suburban mansion in most markets. When presented with those economics, even the most enthusiastic early adopters tend to suddenly lose interest. After everything we've discovered, America's lack of floating cities isn't due to technical limits, but a mix of regulations, engineering hurdles, and high costs. Yet, with rising seas and stronger storms, floating neighborhoods may soon become unavoidable. The real question is whether America will innovate or import solutions from nations that move faster. One way or another, our future may be afloat. Not as a trend, but as a necessity.